Good afternoon, Janet. Um, uh, first of all, how how are you, and how's your husband, and and how's the family at the moment during this during this crisis? Well, we're all doing well. We're housebound, but comfortable and managing uh, to hang in there. It's it's been quite a while. How about yourself? Uh, we're, we're doing very well. We're still housebound as well, although we can move around. We're probably moving around a little bit more freely um, than you at the moment. But we've been working from home since March, so it's just ticked over. Three months now we're, we're yes. working from home. Well, I think we're among the lucky ones who are able to do most everything from home. Uh, we're very we're very lucky. We're in the services uh, businesses where we can where, where we can do that. You know, it has been a struggle for many other people. Uh, Absolutely, around, around the world, it, it's certainly an extraordinary time. You know, I, I, I've been in this for thirty years. Uh, uh, now, this probably has to be one of the most extraordinary periods in history um, that, that I've seen. It, it is so uncertain, I, I believe, what, what, what's going on, what's going to be, what, what's lying ahead of us, which makes it difficult to know what to do uh, at, the, at the moment. So, you know, we, we, we speak quite frequently, but it would, be, it would be really good to get, get, get some of your views um, at the moment with, with what's going on, because this is evolving. A absolutely, yes. I'd be glad to share my views as always, and um, it, it's highly uncertain times. Well, well Janet, you know, we, we go back to the financial crisis in, in 2008 and the beginning of 2009, and that, that was an extraordinary shock uh, for the world, the Federal Reserve has been very aggressive uh, uh, this uh, this time around as well as it was in two thousand and eight. Some of the programs were the same, and some are different. What is similar to two thousand and eight nine, and and what is different about this crisis? Well, what's different about this crisis is that this downturn was induced by a non economic shock, the pandemic, and that's different from two thousand and eight nine or any other downturn I can remember. Um, 2008-9, global financial crisis induced by deep-seated problems in the economy and the financial sector. Incredible leverage, weak banking system, house price bubble, rapid credit growth, weak underwriting standards, over-indebted households. And that was a set of balance sheet problems that had to be worked off before the economy could really recover. And that was a time consuming process. Now, if tomorrow a vaccine were invented, we all had it. Um, the health risks ended. I think the economy could largely go back to pretty much normal. And the pre-pandemic situation in the United States, well, okay, there was, you know, some secular long, you know, trend, long, deep-seated problems. But in a macroeconomic sense, the U.S. was in very good shape. Unemployment was incredibly low. Inflation was low. Um, and so... Um, that's very different than 2008 9. But I don't think the health risks are about to end quickly. And um, if it lasts a long time, as I expect, there's going to be a lot of scarring. Um, companies in the US at least started with a lot of debt, they're going to take on more. So balance sheet repair for them is going to be necessary. There are likely to be significant corporate failures. And that points to weak investment and employment hiring coming out of the, uh, going into the recovery. And households are going to suffer damage to their finances. They've been well supported in the United States so far, but I doubt that's going to be uh, the case going forward. And so they're going to need to restore financial buffers. And you know, the government has been doing a lot to support the economy. I hope some of that will continue. But the government, too, is going to end up with a lot more debt, and that will likely diminish future fiscal flexibility. 
Uh, Janet, would you maybe have to explain uh, to, to our viewers in, in some simple terms, you know, what has the Federal Reserve done in this crisis? What, what tools have they, 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 they implemented? They, we've discussed they've certainly been very aggressive on a number of fronts and they've done a few things they've never done before um, in this crisis. So maybe just in simple terms sort of explain what the Federal Reserve's been doing. Absolutely. They've acted quickly and forcefully, and they fall into two categories, monetary policy and emergency lending. On the monetary policy side, they very quickly lowered their overnight short-term interest rate target, the Fed funds rate, effectively to zero. And they essentially promised that it would stay there for a long time. So that's also helped to bring down longer term rates, the market's understanding rates will stay low for a long time. They also began essentially unlimited asset purchases. At first, they were mainly oriented toward market functioning, which was very highly impaired. But in about two weeks, starting in mid-March, the Fed bought almost $2 trillion worth of assets, treasuries, mortgage-backed securities. Um, they saw that there were and, a lot Jennifer, of... Could I just ask, why were they so aggressive in March? You know, $2 trillion is an extraordinary amount to buy in such a short it's, period of time. You know, why were they so aggressive in March? Well, what they found was that the Treasury market was almost not functioning. And part of that, I think, reflects the fact that there were some hedge funds that had taken on huge amounts of leverage doing trades that they're called basis trades, are trying to arbitrage out tiny um, differences in return between the Treasury's futures and spot markets. And they had leverage of 50 or 100 to 1. This sounds and, like long-term capital management all over again. Uh, don't people ever learn the history lessons from history? It was exactly long-term capital management. It was exactly that. So something happened. In long-term capital management, you remember Russia defaulted and suddenly normal, normal uh, pricing relationships in markets began to break down. Liquidity broke down. So you had these hedge funds and reportedly also some um, foreign sellers of treasuries that began massive sales of treasuries. And the dealers weren't able to support that. They really didn't have the balance sheet to support it. So the Fed began to intervene in repo markets. That wasn't enough. They opened a facility for the broker dealers um, to be able to borrow from the Fed. That wasn't enough. And they ended up realizing they had to go in there and buy up all that stuff the hedge funds were selling just to restore market functioning in treasuries. And, you know, if the treasury market doesn't um, work in the United States, it's the basis for pricing in functioning in all the other financial markets. So they had to get that working. And they, I mean, $2 trillion, that, that's really a lot. That's not, that's not a small amount of money. And so that was a massive intervention. Um, the Fed also reactivated swap lines with foreign central banks, something it did in 2008-9 because banks all over the world that do business in dollars found themselves um, under pressure. Um, then in addition to that, they saw stresses developing that were very similar to 2008-9. There were runs on the money market funds. There had been some, ref which also happened in 2008 and 9. Um, some changes had been made, but not enough. And in particular, um, the money funds were allowed to put in place gates and fees. And as their liquidity fell, um, investors began to worry that those um, gates might be erected. And they decided, let's get out before that happens. And before you knew it, um, I mean, I met with corporate executives who said it was the scariest thing they'd ever seen because 
they rely on those money market funds um, to sell commercial paper to, normally maybe three month uh, commercial paper. Um, essentially, liquidity there dried up and you could barely borrow overnight. Now, the Fed had figured out in 2008 and nine what to do to restore um, functioning of money markets and um, the commercial paper market. So in a way, we're very lucky that 2008 and 2009 had actually occurred because this sounds like an this sounds in a crisis of enormous magnitude. And if they didn't get in front of this, and very quickly, if they waited for three or four days or even weeks, we could have had a completely different outcome in financial markets. Well, we we would have had another long term capital management. We would have had a financial crisis due to runs on money market funds, and there were also essentially runs on um, open-end mutual funds, ETFs, corporate bond funds that offer daily liquidity, but invest in um, either investment grade or higher yield corporate bonds or leverage loans. So we are lucky there was 2008-9. The you know, Bernanke Fed had figured out how to set up facilities Everybody had the term sheets in their drawers, and they essentially pulled those out and were able to get them up and running in a matter of days. But they did, they did need support from the Treasury. So these are not purely Fed operations. They require the consent of the Treasury, and in many cases, um, some backing, some fiscal backing to take first losses from the Treasury. That cooperation's been in place. So they did almost everything, almost every facility that was invented for 2008-9 is, is back in place. And that wasn't enough. So they did more. And they were very inventive and they've come up with new facilities. They um, developed facilities essentially to take the tail risk out of markets where corporations um, borrow investors, um, invest in uh, corporate bonds and loans, um, the municipal debt markets. So there's a primary uh, and secondary corporate credit facility. They're out buying shares of ETFs and um, bundles of bonds that meet their criteria. They're willing to buy bonds, um, new issuance of bonds of larger corporations. And they've gone even further. They've set up a facility, they call it their Main Street Lending Facility, that um, they'll, they'll take 95% essentially of loans made by banks to businesses that are um, over 500 employees, but not large enough to access capital markets on their own. And that's brand new. The Fed has never done anything like that. And they're also lending to state and municipal governments, which is a line I never thought they would cross. I had a um, colleague who's advising the governor of California um, called me uh, about three days before this facility is set up, they said, you know, the, she said, you know, we really need support to issue bonds. Uh, spreads have really spiked. Do you think the Fed could do anything about it? And we have a little club of former Fed people that I work with. My next door neighbor is Bernanke, Don Cohn, who was a 40 year veteran of the Fed and former Fed vice chair is next door to him. And we started emailing back and forth and talking about, is this something the Fed would do? And the three of us decided, no way. And I got back to my friend, I mean, getting involved with lending to state and local governments, this is, you know, it can be very politically sensitive, something the Fed, and suppose, suppose there are defaults. Does the Fed want to be in the, position of um, taking cities in the United States into bankruptcy? Certainly not. Um, so I told her no way. And two days later, they announced the municipal liquidity facility that does just that. So 
they've really pulled out all the stops and I think things have improved considerably. So we've got a health crisis causing an economic crisis, but we don't have a financial crisis. Janet, a lot of people are talking about a shape of the economic recovery at the moment. I think we've got most letters of the alphabet. We've got W's, we've got U's, we've got V's. I think we've got the Nike swoosh people are talking about as the shape of the economic recovery. Do you have a view whether or not we are likely to get a sort of V-shaped recovery or something that looks close to a V-shaped recovery? Are we likely to get a depression on the other end of this spectrum? Or is it really too difficult to call at the moment what the shape of the economic recovery will be until we know more about the virus and how long it's going to last for? Well, it's highly uncertain and what happens definitely depends on the course of the virus and um, vaccines and treatments. But if I had to choose one of those options you gave, I'd choose swoosh rather than V. And the thing about a swoosh is it starts off looking like a V. You have a fast collapse followed by a rapid rebound. And I think we are seeing, at least in the United States, um, well, certainly a huge plunge. Um, 5% um, negative growth in the first quarter. Um, most forecasters for the second are looking for something in the order of 30 to 40% GDP growth negative at an annual rate, shocking. But probably May was the bottom and we're seeing quite a few indicators suggesting an impressive recovery. Um, surprisingly positive employment report in May and also a strong rebound in consumer spending. There have been enormous fiscal transfers and huge monetary support. And in other countries also, we're seeing a bounce back with a lot of support. So um, states are now um, beginning to end their lockdowns. We've seen people who were on temporary, um, temporary unemployment spells um, go back to work. And so it's beginning to look V-shaped, but swoosh is where I go because I don't think that's going to continue. I think we're going to see solid growth in the second half of the year, but um, I'm expecting that over the course of the year as a whole, output in the U.S. is going to decline by something in the 5 to 8% range. And then I think we'll get growth after that. But to get back to where we started, I believe will take a number of additional years. And I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that um, there's just going to be, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of corporate failure. Um, there'll be a need for social distancing uh, for a long time. Um, we're beginning to see a resurgence in the United States of infection. There's um, all too high a probability of a second wave um, that's going to come next, next fall. Um, you know, there's been a lot of temporary uh, layoffs. 75% of people who have been laid off think they're going to go back to their old job. They say that in surveys. Um, but on the other hand, 25% of people think they're not going to go back to their old job. And my guess is that some in the 75% will turn out too. They're not going to go back to their old jobs. And it's just going to take a long time to get the um, labor market back to normal. Um, also, there's the issue of fiscal support. So there's been a huge amount of fiscal support in the United States. There are individuals who aren't getting it, so there are pockets of pain. But on average, unemployment compensation is very generous. Um, the replacement ratio, namely the share of your percentage of your um, pre-layoff pre income that people are getting back, it averages over 90%. And for low-income workers, it's more than 100%. 
at this point. So that's extremely generous. There were $1,200 checks sent out to most uh, individuals. But a lot of that, there's a kind of fiscal cliff. A lot of it ends this summer. The expanded unemployment payments end at the end of July. Congress is talking about doing more, but who knows what's going to happen. So um, I think there's a lot to retard or recovery, and I expect a swoosh, um, not, a, not a V. I wish we'd see a V, but I don't think so. Well, that, that, that's very sobering, uh, Janet, and somewhat disconnected with what the equity markets uh, are doing at the moment. You know, there's 20 million Americans who are unemployed at the moment, but, but one of the statistics that it doesn't pick up is the people on the Paycheck Protection Program. So there's a lot of medium-sized and small businesses who are being paid, for, paid, paid by the government to keep their employees on the payrolls at the moment, and there's a cliff at the end of that program. So, and we have them in Australia, and they have them in the UK, and they have them in Germany. So the unemployment statistics still don't tell you the real level of unemployed. There are people who are prolonged in the economy who just assume that they're going back to work because they're being paid for by the company, which is paid for by the government. And these, a lot of these companies don't have any intention of keeping some of these people on their payrolls once the government support disappears. I think you're absolutely right about that, that that was a condition of being eligible for that program. And um, many of those businesses want the loans to be forgiven. And I think you're absolutely right. And it's been extended, the length of the program. But I think that's a, fa that's a factor as well. So, um, you know... I, it, it's highly uncertain things could come out bet, you know, better than I'm expecting, but um, while well, we're seeing some, some resurgence of employment, we have another employment report on Friday, and you know, probably we're going to see, again, solid employment gains, but we lost so many jobs that um, two or two and a half million um, job gains you still have a long way to go to recover what was lost. And, and Janet, what, what are the risks that most worry you at the moment with this situation? Well, I worry about the permanent job loss and um, how those people are going to get reemployed. I think that's going to be um, a long, drawn-out process that I find it hard to imagine that hospitality, travel, tourism, uh, consumer-facing sectors are going to come back to anything close to where they were for a very long time. So there's going to be a lot of permanent layoffs in those sectors. Um, structural changes that were underway in sectors like retail will be accelerated. Uh, you know, I'm enjoying working from home. It sounds like uh, you feel the same way I do. And I know a lot of firms that have no intention of going back to their old ways of doing business. So, um, you know, changes are going to occur um, as a consequence of living through this. Um, so I'm worried about the workers, their um, attachment to the labor market, I think there will be people who um, don't come back and are permanently sidelined. And I'm very worried about the degree of fiscal support, which we truly um, need to keep the recovery going. And I don't know if that's going to be there. But I, I've worried about a lot of stuff. Hamish, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about? What's on your worry list? Well, there's actually a lot on my worry, worry list. The first thing I would say is, Janet, there are so many known unknowns at the moment. You know, there are so many issues that we know about, but we don't know how they're going to play out. You, you've highlighted many of them about are these jobs coming back? What are the effects there? We don't know the duration of this pandemic. There are so many uncertainties about the science behind the virus and heading towards a cure. We're reopening economies, I would say, too early. Uh, from a from a medical point of view, we're seeing a resurgence, um, particularly in the United States, the emerging markets, it appears to be out of control. Probably the number one issue on my mind, and we can talk about this, is the, the financial markets, 
because of the aggressiveness of the Fed, have literally priced in an unlimited put option um, to the Fed. They, they go, whatever risks come up, the Federal Reserve is going to be there. But there are limits to what the Federal Reserve can do, particularly in the emerging markets. You, you mentioned some swap lines have been put in place. It was a very inventive swap line that hasn't been drawn down yet, but it was the where they could repo the treasuries held right. at the, the New York Fed. If an emerging market runs out of US dollar collateral that it could that it could uh, repo in order to get dollars, I imagine there's many countries in the world that the Federal Reserve just is not going to take the credit risk in a standard swap line uh, with. And if an emerging market can't get access to dollars via the Fed and then has to start liquidating any foreign assets that they have. I think that's near the end of the Fed's capability to, to, to step in. And markets just aren't seeing that, that in a true crisis in emerging markets, there's only so much a central bank can do. And it really comes down to sort of a treasury operation on a global scale. And we've got an election coming up in the United States with America first. I'm not sure America's going to step in with a trillion dollars to bail out emerging markets at the moment. And the Fed can't really do that. And there, there are credit risks, and we've talked about this, and the Fed is, is very conscious of the high yield markets. Um, yes. Yeah, and there, there's some of these programs are put in place are trying to catch some investment grade people going into the high yield markets. But the high yield markets, if we get accelerating bankruptcies and we get real disruption, there are limits on what the Federal Reserve can... You, you said you've been surprised by what they're that we're done, but just the markets assuming that there's a put option, that there's no downside risk here if this gets worse and the Fed can keep coming up with new things, there are limits, I think, in what the Federal Reserve can do. And people shouldn't just extrapolate because they've been so aggressive that there is no downside uh, here. And there, there, are, there, are, there are things lurking in the dark here that you can see how these bushfires could go off. Um, um, here. So, you know, that really worries me that the people don't understand those sort of smouldering fires at the moment. And if some of them went off, they are really difficult to deal with. I completely agree with you. And I expect very high levels of bankruptcies and defaults. The underwriting standards on leverage loans deteriorated enormously. I think the losses on those loans um, if they default will, could well be far higher than investors are accustomed to. And I agree with you, there are limits to what the Fed can do to protect investors for losses. And the market seems um, not to be fully pricing in the downside risks. I mean, with respect to emerging markets, you, you mentioned the new Fed facility, which was kind of an innovation and I think has been helpful. Um, Congress has in no way authorized the Fed to make loans, dollar loans, to emerging markets around the world. The swap lines that we've had with the largest central banks have always been rationalized in terms of um, the importance to the United States that uh, banks around the world support American businesses, both in the United States and households and around the world. And it's important that they have the liquidity to go on doing that. If this is cast, if the Fed were to cast it as simply a way to help other countries that are in trouble, Congress would close that off in a second. So they've expanded the number of central banks that they're including in the swap lines. That again, 2008, they did that. They brought in Korea, Singapore, Australia, others. Um, those are all back in, but there are limits. And I, I think it's hard to imagine they'd do more. But what they've done um, that's kind of calmed financial markets, I think has been helpful to the emerging markets because what you're seeing coming back, now this may be temporary, but you're seeing risk appetite. And um, part of what happened to emerging markets is they saw enormous capital outflows that was putting tremendous pressure on them and their currencies. 
And now that you have very low rates and spreads have come down and there's a search for yield again, you're seeing that reverse emerging market spreads have come down and that's a little bit of indirect support for emerging markets. And Janet, I, I agree with you that, that a lot of the, the pressure has come out and volatility has gone down dramatically, but the virus is running rampant in some of these, in many of these emerging markets. And you extrapolate or out six months time and you think, where will the virus be and where will their economies be? And what happens if we get a massive capital outflow in six months time in these emerging markets and we get them under enormous stress because uh, there's limits at what these emerging markets can do to bail themselves out. So you go, if yes. it's not very, very bad in some of these emerging markets, and certainly from a medical point of view, it looks horrendous potentially in some of these emerging markets, you could see another run on their currencies, even though we're seeing dead calm at the moment. And there is limits what the Fed can do. The, the, the Fed is effectively saying is if you've got US dollar collateral based in the United States that we can have access to, we will do a repo with you with that collateral right. if it's treasury. Yes. But these, there's a limit. If they run out of collateral that's acceptable to the Fed that's based in the United States, they're not going to do an overnight swap line just on the basis of swapping their currency with some of these exotic emerging markets. I think you're right, the Congress would have a heart attack. That is unsecured lending. Yeah, no, the, the Fed's not allowed, is not allowed to do that. And I, you know, again, I, I've been surprised by things the Fed has decided to do, but I would be very surprised um, if, if they went further with emerging markets. In, you know, in part because this was a virus that affected the, fi you know, the economy and the financial system, Congress has been very supportive of the Fed stepping in to help to keep credit flowing in a way that they were not in 2008 and 2009. It, in, in the earlier crisis, um, a lot of people felt banks were responsible in the financial sector for what was happening, and they were not supportive of um, Fed efforts to try to contain the damage to financial markets. This time, there's a lot of support for the Fed acting, but um, there are still limits. Uh, Janet, many people are focused on the scale of quantitative easing and the scale of fiscal deficits. I think America's maybe going to run a $4 trillion deficit this year. Uh, the Fed has already expanded its balance sheet, I think, by $3 trillion uh, since, since the end of February. Maybe it's more. Uh, than that they're expanding every day. And people will say this in, is inevitably going to lead to inflation. Um, here, this, this printing of money on this scale and running very large deficits um, uh, here. And they talk about the Weimar Republic and, and, and other factors. How concerned are you about inflation? And could we see higher interest rates? Or, or what's your view on that topic at the moment? So... I'm not at all concerned about inflation for, let's say, a time horizon of two, three, four years during which the economy is, is recovering. Um, I think we're going to need very low interest rates for a long time. Inflation has been, um, is, is under downward pressure. This is both a supply and a demand shock, but the decline in demand, which tends to lower inflation, um, is much larger than the um, decline in supply, which creates isolated upward pressure in some sectors. And you've already seen, um, in, at least in the United States, inflation um, numbers that are extremely low. Um, so I'm not worried about inflation at all in the short term. Um, if the economy recovers, now it gets to be a different story because we get to the point where the Fed may need to raise interest rates to stop demand from outstripping supply. And there's nothing about 
having bought all those assets. Often people think, okay, they bought all those assets, trillions of dollars worth of assets, and it'll, it'll continue. Um, and they created all those bank reserves, and that's money, and money causes inflation. But that's not how it works, because um, we think of money, and you know, this is what we're taught in our economics classes, is that money is an asset that pays no interest. But bank reserves do pay interest. They pay whatever interest the Fed decides is appropriate. At the moment, the Fed's decided zero is appropriate. But when the time comes when higher interest is appropriate, that stuff you call money, those reserves that now pay zero, they're going to pay interest. The Fed is going to raise the interest rate. They're going to become more like debt and not like what we think of as money. And it's not going to cause inflation. And so it's a really interesting point because this is being done around the world. It's not just the United States. And there may well be some economies. It was an innovation during the financial crisis of paying interest on excess reserves. You used to not pay interest on excess reserves. And that really turned the sort of excess reserves into a financial instrument. It really became a short-term treasury uh, or a Fed treasury maybe would be a better description right. of, of it. But there, there may be countries in the world who are on this exercise and then decide they're not going to pay any interest on their excess reserves. They, well, may, they may actually, is there a risk that some economies are not in the position that the United States is in here? So I think that's really the question, but I believe that's more of a political question than it is an economic question. Independent central banks with inflation mandates, when they see that higher interest rates are needed to contain inflation, they raise interest rates. And that's it, end of story. But the political piece comes in because we're going to have an enormous federal debt. And when the Fed decides to raise interest rates, that's going to increase the interest burden on that debt. And it's going to begin to put some real pressure on the government budget, and the government will have to raise taxes, cut spending, do painful things as interest payments get larger. At the moment, interest payments are very, very low, and they're going to stay low as long as interest rates are low. And um, you well, can say... Do you think that means that because of that, that fiscal fiscal contraction you'll get out on the budget from increasing interest rates, that effectively the level of neutral interest rates will be much lower in the future because they don't have to lift interest rates very much to put the brakes on the economy because of the level of government debt? Well, that's a very interesting mechanism, Hamish, that I hadn't really thought about. But I think you're right that as they start raising interest rates, it has an impact on fiscal policy. It has to become more contractionary. And if that happens, um, yeah, it means that there's less need to raise them to very high levels. So, I mean, that's an interesting idea, and I think it's right. But, you know, more generally, we were very worried about secular stagnation, weak spending in the economy, a lot of saving, weak investment, creating an environment in which there would be a prolonged um, reason for interest rates to stay low, low inflation to low inflation. And um, I think the pandemic has just intensified that problem. So I frankly, my baseline, I, I don't see a need. I don't think we're going to go back to a world anytime soon where interest rates need to be high to contain inflation. So this problem of putting the government in a bad situation, it, it may not arise. They, you know, life is uncertain. And sometimes central banks lose their independence when the government decides they've really got problems and they got to go to that agency down the street that um, forced them to hold interest rates low and buy the debt they issued. And that's how you end up with very high or hyperinflation. I don't think that's going to happen in the United States, but it's that political piece that is where the concern would be. And 
Janet, if people have been listening, they may be a little bit depressed so far in their conversation where we're having. Obviously, we have these conversations and we just <laughs> discuss it as we see it. Um, but, you know, it's not all negative in, in, in terms of what's, what, what's going on in, in, in the economy if you take a longer term view. What, what are the things that, that you're most optimistic about at, at, the, at the moment? Maybe just to round out on some positive side of things rather than all this doom and gloom. You bet. Um, I'm optimistic about progress on vaccines and treatments. Um, we've got a very inventive scientific community that's very hard at work. Um, what I hear about vaccine development is very positive. And so um, conceivably late this year, early next year, we'll have vaccines that are going into production. Um, I've been pleased that um, Congress and the administration have supported a very active role for fiscal policy. I'm worried about what's going to happen this summer, but I'm optimistic that there will be um, continued support. And um, we do have an election coming up, and um, I'm hopeful that we will come out of that um, with a renewed willingness to address some of these problems and a more organized um, strategy. But, you know, what about you? What, do you? what are you thinking, Hamish? What, do, you, are, do you find things to be optimistic about? Look, in the short term, in the next 12 months or so, it's, it's, it's very uncertain about which pathway we're going to head down economically um there so yeah and that, that's a lot of what we've been discussing but what am i optimistic about i'm optimistic about humanity and progress of, of humanity and the moment we all get caught up in all the negative stuff and things we're at the end of the road you look what's happened in this world in the last 200 years when we're speaking on a computer at the other end of the world how did this ever happen how did it ever happen from 200 years ago where there was no technology, electricity had just been invented, to the point that we're speaking at the other route of the world on a live video conference here? That is the progress of humanity here. You, you talked, you were optimistic on a, on a vaccine. In the next 20 to 50 years, we'll make enormous progress in medical science uh, for the benefit of humanity. We, we, I'm optimistic around the technological advancements we're seeing uh, in, the, in the world and the benefit that that can do for uh, humanity. I'm optimistic that human progress will actually solve climate change, even well, though, we're caught, up, the even though we, we, we're caught up that we, we feel like it's never going to be solved. But I'm optimistic that humanity will, 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 will solve this. We're now looking to space again. After a, after a dead zone, we're looking, we're looking to space again. I'm very optimistic what humans can do with our intelligence and our collective power. And I think you're right with the change in some of the politics that's going and we look at what collectively we've done as a human race and what we can do as a human race is when I take a longer term view and I want to invest behind some of that technological improvements in the world, I'm pretty optimistic that if I take a 10 year view, things are gonna turn out pretty well. But in the next 12 to 18 months, it's incredibly uncertain. I don't wanna mislead people um, uh, uh, about the uncertainty, but if you take a longer term view, don't get too caught up in the moment and think longer term about the progress humanity keeps making. So as you think about this in terms of portfolio and investment strategy, is your focus on um, the long term, or uh, do you see a need to position yourself uh, for the shorter term, given what's happening? What, what you're thinking about investment strategy? We're running a very conservative position in the portfolios at the moment. We're holding a lot of cash, very defensive. We're very underweight emerging markets uh, in the portfolio. But at the same time, we've got some very large positions in large technology-enabled growth companies as well. So whilst we're being conservative in the short term, we've got our eye on where the ball's going in the longer term uh, as well. So we're, 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 we're kind of bifurcated. We're doing both, Janet, at the moment. We're, we're, we're keeping investments that are very advantaged in the long term 
and supported by technological and actually um, changes that are happening at the moment. You know, there, there's an accelerant occurring. As much as there's bad things that are going on, this crisis is, is accelerating some behaviours and trends that were already uh, happening. I'm optimistic that this work from home environment is actually going to lead to a better work-life balance for many, many people in the workforce. And it would have never happened without this crisis because business wouldn't have taken the risk to try it because everyone would have been sceptical about it. I completely agree with you. And I think people have been really surprised at just how well it's working. And a lot of technology is um, developed around that that I think will change the ways in which businesses um, are conducted in, in a lot of different dimensions. Well, Janet, we, we may wrap it up. Firstly, on behalf of Magellan, thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was incredibly uh, comprehensive to, to get all your, your, your insight. But probably with what's going on, we really hope everyone around you stays safe in, in this environment. That's the most important thing. And I know you've been extremely careful <laughs> at, well. at home. And the same to you, Hamish, stay safe, stay well. Um, hope we get through this and can continue to talk. Thanks, Janet, much appreciated.